Okay, <clears throat> hello everyone. This is Hamid Armadi. Uh, welcome back to the session four of the uh, Shihara Colloquium. Uh, we can go to the next one, Steve. What mayor? Um, he Steve is a principal of Collins Warman with 31 years of experience leading government, landowner, and project team toward increased sustainability and resilience. So I stop my presentation, my, my screen, then uh, hand it to Steve. Do we have Joy? We see a couple of yes. slides? Yes. Great. Well, thank you, Hamid. And uh, that was a... Uh, Boy, it's been an interesting day. A lot of a lot of topics, and I'm kind of going to be in the opposite direction, I guess. Um, I'm going to talk about people and how they react to getting shook up, uh, not by earthquakes, but just by disasters in general. And I thought that liquefaction, you know, like where the molecules are kind of in suspension, and when they get shaken up, they rearrange, and that's kind of what happens in the work I do. And I'm, I'm kind of a pra I'm a practice guy, not an academic. So um, what I wanted to talk about was maybe what uh, what we mean when we're talking about transformational uh, recovery after disasters and the need for transformation around, around equity, as well as how we just deal with people who are uh, find themselves in these tough situations. And um, the title is about command and control because that's what happens when you're responding to a disaster. You just go and you make things happen. But the mitigation beforehand and the recovery afterwards is not command and control. And, and that distinction between when one stops and the other starts, I think is, is one thing I wanted to highlight um, of several. So thanks for the chance to present. And I'm grateful to the folks that are hanging in for the, uh, for the, for this part of the presentation. So if things work well, my next slide will emerge. So a problem solution example, the built environment is designed for the climate we used to have. And we don't know what the climate we're gonna have is except that it's gonna be more extreme more often. So we have the entire built environment is designed for what we used to have, which makes us all more vulnerable. When we rebuild after the last disaster, we start hardwiring in some of the inequities that we used to have before we were enlightened about inequity. Uh, so, Because if we just rebuild what was broken, then we may be hardwiring in another generation to be vulnerable to a changed climate. And so we keep setting the stage for the next disaster if we just rebuild what broke. The third bullet is that what I'm calling the disaster industrial complex, which is kind of the academic and the consultants and the government entities that deal with disasters, we tend to have treated disasters as something that happened one at a time. And I know from the presentations earlier today that, that uh, we have a huge growing awareness that they're not like that, but that, that still kind of permeates how we think about disasters and certainly how we govern disasters. And it's no longer true. And so what, uh, what we find and what uh, um, uh, Sue Cutter said this morning, and we also found in a report uh, that's coming out from the National Academies in a couple of weeks, that I was uh, proud to be part of. Um, social, economic, and natural hazards all, all hazards all combine to create a near constant compound in cascading disasters. We have people who are recovering from social, economic, and other natural disasters still trying to recover when the next one hits. And so this, this kind of getting punished while you're down makes it harder and harder to have capacity. So what's the solution? Uh, it's easy, just transformational recovery, where we co-create the resilience of the local area with the people who live there. And one of the things that I've found in my practice is that we use local shared values as criteria for success, that we can get people that normally don't get along to find a way to get along, to develop things together that they actually want to happen, and that they often end up being multi-benefit solutions that you wouldn't get any other way. So I think that there's a real opportunity here to kind of address equity, inequity, and the fact that people are caught in this kind of rinse uh, cycle of disaster recovery to kind of help them navigate that in a new way and give them the tools to, to be successful. So I'm gonna use the Nooksack River uh, as uh, uh, an example. I've been working in several of the watersheds and this is up in Washington State. 
Uh, this is, you know, you can you can see Washington State here. That's Canada. So in their upper corner here, this is British Columbia. Uh, this is the Nooksack River. And I was working with a group called the FLIP Group, which is the Floodplain Integrated Planning Group. And it includes the two Native American tribes, small cities are basically rural farmers that uh, use an irrigation districts that work in the valley and get a lot of flooding, the Whatcom County River and Flood folks, and state and federal agencies. And together, they work on fish habitat restoration, flood management, and keeping farming intact. And so it's a, it's a nice mix of interests who have often clashed in the past, but they have developed a nice pattern of working well together. Here's a little zoom in on the map. Again, there's the Canada up in the top. This is Mount Baker, which is a 10,700 foot volcano. It's, uh, it dumps out a ton of uh, sediment. In fact, this river has the most sediment of any in Washington state. So there's uh, debris from the mountain and then de debris from erosion in the hills. So as the rivers go down and then join, they get into the flat floodplain and the debris really piles up and the river itself is actually perched over the floodplain as it, as it drops sediment and then the, the channel stays above. Uh, what's interesting about this uh, is the river goes through this town of Everson, Bass Linden, Bass Ferndale, and then back out to the salt water here. Salmon come in and use this system as much as they can. Uh, but what's intriguing is this little Sumas River right here that goes north into Canada and connects actually with the Fraser River up to the north. That's actually uh, the, the riverbed for the Nooksack River that swaps around every few hundred years. So for thousands of years, it just went north. And for the last several hundreds of years, it's gone to the west. And it still wants to do that flip-flop. So it's ends up when flooding happens that it's an international incident and there are there is damage and Canada has evolved to not have that river there. And when it shows up all at once, it's a problem for everyone. And certainly the tribes don't want, or no one really wants 20 miles of dewatered river if the river does keep going north. So it's uh, one of the interesting dynamics. In February of 2020, uh, working with the community, we did a what we call the value planning session. And this is basically a, a design charrette with local folks where we use local values to figure out how we can work things. So we worked on Reach 2 between Linden and Ferndale, and we, we helped people come together and use their values to come up with solutions that work. It was super successful. People liked it of every political persuasion. Uh, they, they actually come up with stuff that works, and they liked that it happened. Well, that was February 2020. In November 2021 were some major floods that I'll describe in a minute. And then after that major flood, we said, okay, let's do value planning again. So we did one this April. And again, we brought together people that have already been shaken uh, by going through this incredible flood. And, and again, the value planning work, using shared values, got people who are actually really having a tough time to find hope together to find collaboration together and work together. Uh, but the limit, there's limits to how much you can do, but I guess I'm basically saying that this technique works. So let me briefly describe what value planning is. Uh, you invite people uh, from kind of that represent the, the range of interests and in land ownership and in the community. You get them thinking together, designing together, coming up with solutions in, a, in an all day workshop. So here's the process. Um, this is a one day workshop where, and you start with the shared values and I've mentioned this multiple times. One of the things we, we do is we say, okay, everyone in the room, just write down on the stickies in front of you, write down a value that you think we have in this watershed or this basin. So someone will write, well, we have family values. Someone will say, well, we're pra pra practical. Someone else will write environmental protection. Someone else will write robust fishery. Someone else will write uh, cost effective. Whatever you write, that's great. Uh, after a few minutes of that, we say, okay, now go up and put it on the wall. And if you see one of your idea, uh, one of your values and see one that's similar, stick yours next to it. So everybody gets up and mobilizes. And then pretty soon, within about 20 minutes, there's about eight to 12 clumps of values that everyone in the room created together. And then we say, okay, the best solutions will, be all, will meet all of those values. 
And they're, they're the car criteria for success. If we can come up with ideas that do a good job on all multiple values, that's going to be a better project than one that only gets one of them. So if you only have can be cost effective, that's not good enough if you also can't handle family values, if you also can't help be pragmatic, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, people agree to that. And it's really uh, fantastic how well that works. We then kind of say, okay, here's some ideas from other places where folks have done creative stuff. So we see their thinking in the morning. And then we say, okay, let's go to work. And then we they break into teams where they basically have tables of about six. People sit down and they take their some clusters of ideas that they've developed together. And then they perfect them by making them meet more of those shared values. At the end of that day, and I've done this about 18 times uh, throughout, uh, mostly in Washington State, a little bit in Oregon. Um, people are jazzed. They're excited. They connected with people. They've been working all day. They've been thinking things through. They've come up with really interesting ideas. And they've worked with people who are typically their opponents to come up with ideas that meet both of their values. So it tends to be a high point. They then hand that work off to a consulting team that we've assembled for each one that's different depending upon the issues. The consulting team then says, okay, we're going to take those and we're going to make them figure out how to make them work. So we don't say, no, we don't do that here. We, we Instead, we say, well, if you really want to do that, here's how you do it. And so it may be changes in legislation. It may be technical analysis. It may be a bunch of different things. But we basically put weight and, and resources behind trying to make their ideas work. Uh, we then report back and have a local trade-off and implementation workshop maybe 12 weeks later. The same people come back. We say, hey, remember the values we had? Remember the ideas you came up with? Well, here's what happened when we looked at it as technical folks. Here's what we think really has potential, and here's, and here's what we, we came up with. What do you think? Which ones should happen soon? Which ones should happen later? Are you in? Do you want to help make it happen? Um, what do you think? And so this re-engages local folks and gets them thinking, how am I involved in making something happen in my community that represents our values and that I actually maybe have some hope can happen? So the, the results are that we end up with a bunch of projects that are relevant. Number two, opponents recognize that, wow, that, you know, I've been fighting that person for eight years and they just agreed to the same values that I put up there. And they kind of, side eye each other and like, really, you're agreeing to that? And they, and they go, oh, well, that's interesting. So then they realize, yeah, we actually can work together as long as we understand we're working on shared values. And it starts to build trust and trust is definitely the coin of the realm and disaster world. Uh, if we trust each other, we can do things that we can never do if we don't. It creates shared ownership and the solutions that come up with. And then, as I mentioned, we have multi-benefit solutions, which typically don't happen. If you ask the irrigation district, design a solution, they'll come up with something that works for the irrigation district, but doesn't necessarily represent this broader range. So you get much more interesting projects out of the end. So that was uh, in April of 2020 or February of 2020. And then this happened and hopefully you're seeing this animation. This is basically an atmospheric river. This is the flooding started, I think on the 15th or the 16th, but this is a, this is a, Washington uh, and Canada here. This is the Hawaiian Islands. And you can just see there's this stream atmospheric river of tropical moisture. And according to folks, there were five of these in a row that just hammered, hammered the place. So this river that used to kind of hang around and its bounds started flooding pretty much everywhere. Uh, it normally runs this way off to the coast, off to the west. But things started going sideways and a lot of water ran and ran right through Sumas. So there were in Washington state or in this county, actually 2,000 homes were damaged. 590 families needed help. There's at least $250 million worth of damages that have already been calculated. 92 homeowners who got impacted said, please buy me out. I don't ever want to go through this again. Buy my house. Help me move out of here. Uh, so far, uh, and this has been about 10 months, the FEMA payout has been about $5,900 per claim, uh, which might be just appropriate for some folks, but it's probably way below what really happened uh, and what people really need. Uh, so it's, a, it's been a challenging situation. Oh, and I should uh, mention 
Right up here is Sumas, it's the border town. So this is one of the places we cross into Canada. Well, here's what happened in Sumas, pretty much the whole downtown, everywhere got flooded, 520 uh, uh, buildings and, and homes were damaged. Um, uh, two months ago, at least half of them were still un uninhabitable. So the whole town basically got whacked and hasn't recovered. And if you think about it, it's a long time to be out of a house and to not have a place to live and to be living on friends' couches or staying in a motel if you got some support from FEMA. Everson, this is the town where the river wants to take a right and go back up to Canada. So there's this narrow uh, pinch point in the, in the river where there's a bridge that, of course, the floodwaters went around the town and got hundreds of homes uh, also damaged. So the thing I want to talk about is that this is when once you get shaken, uh, this is a normal pattern for how people react to, to getting a, a, a being a disaster. They know it's coming. There's all well, we're getting atmospheric river flooding is expected. The flooding happens and people's motions go through the roof because they're rescuing each other. They're they you know, brave acts of bravery. Uh, people are so glad when if they survive and they kind of go, you know, we lost everything, but at least we have each other. That's what really counts. You know, and so there's this and we actually worked together because it was my neighbor who came and rescued me. It's a really powerful moment where people feel this wonderful sense of bonding that then is followed by months and months and months of nothing happening that gets good. It, the reality sinks in. It's hard. Life is hard. And it's not getting better soon. I'm not going to get fixed. Uh, if I want FEMA to buy me out, it's two to three years before they're going to come. And I've got flood season coming, you know, in three months now. So this disillusionment phase is actually a very toxic time. It's certainly underway in this basin, and it happens pretty much everywhere, where people that like to cause problems start rumors, they misinform, they get people agitated, people are already agitated. So we did our second charrette, that one I mentioned in April, you know, and it was a little bit of an uptick, but it was right in the heart of this really tough time. But again, it's not enough to really make it all get better, but, it, but it's a start. But one of the things that we've learned and we've heard from Sue Cutter and others is that we're not getting disasters one at a time anymore. You don't just get to recover and then go back to life as sweet. You actually end up in this getting whacked again and again and again. And so, you know, if, you, if you're already down and then you get flooded again or you get COVID or you get or you go bankrupt or uh, there's an earthquake or there are forest fire, whatever it's going to be. All those things can kind of get you while you're down. And so your adaptive capacity is severely reduced. And the things that help people have capacity is trust, uh, resources, um, you know, good relationships, access to, to resources when they need them. And those things are all in a depleted state while this recovery drags on and on. So one thing that Adam Rose said today was that with business, if you can just get back up to business, you're good. But when you're a human being or a family, uh, it's not uh, the economics is only part of it, but it's a big part. But but there's all the trauma that you really have to deal with and learn from. So I'm not going to explain this slide. You're lucky, except I'm going to break it into pieces. Basically, before the disaster, lots of projects get done working with this floodplain integrated planning group. Really good, positive work together to make things happen that help prepare for flooding. The flood happens, and we kind of go from this relationships and collaboration into command and control. And it's kind of like, I don't care what the rules are. We need to dump 100 yards of something right here, even if it's salmon habitat. We're sorry. Uh, it's an, it's an important. Everyone understands that, and everyone breaks down and kind of goes and takes care of their business. They're not working together anymore as a collaborative entity. They're all just trying to rescue and stabilize, which is what... Command and control is really good at it. But at some point, very soon, you need to go back to the relationships and collaboration. And, and when is that? And when do you go out of, I'm just doing stuff, to I'm going to start talking to people and working it together? Well, in the NUCSAC, it was about uh, from November to April. So it was five months later. We finally met again. And we basically said, look, we have all these challenges our trust was really stressed because people did stuff that would never be allowed. Uh, the people are in the in the state of glooms. Uh, 
uh, the disillusionment phase. So the rumors are going, people are blaming, they're pointing at each other. Um, and this is not, I'm not, I love these people. So I enjoy working with them. I'm not trying to be mean to them. This is what normally happens. Uh, but even on the feds who are coming in to rescue, they kind of have a, a command and control mindset. And the processes that the federal government uses are so opaque and so hard to understand. It's just uh, really ungainly. And even the federal programs that come in, they showed up and they said, tell us what you need and I'll let you know if it fits with one of my grant programs that no one understands. And so there's very much a sense of how do we get out of this muck and, we, and can we work together? So we did that second charrette uh, value planning session. We brought together many of the key folks they then kind of had a, yeah, okay, we've got stuff. So we're in the middle of that process now, and, and it does work. So if we're going to really deal with ongoing disasters that compound and cascade, we need to get better at doing before the disaster. We need to be thinking about recovery before and after. And if we have to go, which we do through the command and control phase, we really need to be building up the capacity of the community. And I think one way to do it is with these kind of value-based local empowerment efforts because they give people uh, the relationships they need. It helps build trust. It helps them build solutions that fit for them. And it's grounded in the real place that they're at. It's not provided by someone else. It's their, their thing for their future. So the next steps on, in, in the journey that I'm on, at least in working with groups around value planning, is to integrate in these five essential elements of mass trauma intervention. And uh, this just came up the other day, but I found it really useful. It's a paper by Hobb Full from 2007. But basically, if, uh, if there's a mass trauma event, people there's five things that the research shows. They need a sense of safety. They need calming, which in this case means kind of information like from getting in touch with family or having things that they do together that are not just disaster. Uh, they need self-efficacy and collective efficacy. They need to do things together. They need connectedness with, within their groups, but also broadly. And they need to have some sort of hope that there's a way out. And I, when I was seeing these five steps, I was like going, you know, with value planning, we actually are doing a lot of these things. And I think that I'm going to try and integrate into this framing so that we can even get better at it, so that we really are building the capacity of a community to navigate these really tough times and then have everything they need uh, when the next disaster strikes, which is someday soon coming to a town near you. So uh, thank you for the time. Um, this is um, actually, if you go on YouTube and Google the Nooksack River Nature of Change, this is a cute little cartoon uh, video that was put together before the floods but it was a nice job of, of, of it was from the flip group. And it was basically how we're working together on behalf of living, working with this living river and all of the living people that are in it. So let me just close there and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation. So we have a, a question for you, but I think we will keep it for the end of the session for the all question. Right. So uh, we have something there as well uh, to talk about it. Uh, so I'm going to go for the third one. Uh, <clears throat> I share it well. So uh, yeah. OK, our uh, third one is uh, Kid Miyamoto, Dr. Amir Gilani, and me. Uh, Kid is the CEO of the Miyamoto International. Amir Gilani is the technical lead and the manager with Miyamoto International. They both have PhD in structural engineering, uh, and uh, um, I have a PhD in structural engineering. Uh, I was with Miyamoto, uh, not anymore, so I am uh, working with Bechtel, uh, earthquake engineering team. So the presentation was supposed to be uh, uh, presented by uh, Keith. Um, then he is in Afghanistan right now. And uh, then uh, I asked Amir to take over and do it. So he was supposed to do it, but uh, he is in a structure engineer association of the California uh, conference. So 
they asked me to take over it. So uh, I'm, I'm gonna do it, but most likely, I mean, um, I can do as good as they do. So, uh, and uh, a lot of question I need to refer to that. Uh, but here is the presentation of the kid and me and me. I go back to disaster and structural resilience, the impact of uh, climate change on the performance of built environment. Uh, as you can see, uh, there is a, a ring of fire line, uh, tectonic, tectonic pl plates. Uh, uh, that's the ring, uh, ring of fire is the red line uh, and the blue dots are the uh, actually location that uh, Miyamoto International has his offices in. Uh, so most of the earthquakes are gonna happen in, on, in those uh, ring of fire lines. So uh, that's the uh, most like source of the earthquake hazard. And since 1971 to 2021, there have been more than 2022, there have been more than 100 disasters, 100 earthquake uh, hazard happened and they caused disasters. Uh, so they are listed, they, and these, these are the list of the earthquake uh, which uh, has a magnitude of 5.0 and higher. Uh, so if you notice since then the number of the num number of the national nat uh, natural hazard increased uh, and uh, you can see uh, after after like 20 uh, 2010 it decreases slightly but mostly uh, since 1970 we have increased in all of the natural hazard hazard the uh, wildfire the earthquake like stream uh, temperature drop so everything increased but at the same time, we are increasing the number uh, number of the people, the populations in the cities. Mostly, most uh, most of uh, a lot of more uh, constructions, buildings, and um, we are increasing our vulnerability um, to, uh, against this hazard. So uh, that that that's a problem uh, for for our cities and societies. Uh, these disasters, they, they, uh, sorry, uh, they are pretty expensive for the societies, for the government and for people. So, for example, the Katrina in 2005, it cost about 166 billion cost for the, uh, for the U.S. or, or, uh, 2011, uh, earthquake and tsunami in Japan to, to, to Hoko. That, that caused about uh, 260, 236 billion or, or, or 3 billion for the Philippines in 2013 or, or 2014, 8 billion. So a lot of this, uh, uh, like a lot of the structures, a lot of this damage are not, are not uh, mostly by uninsured uh, buildings and assets. So most of it goes to the uninsured. Uh, people and, and properties that was the earthquake but in terms of the non-earthquake hazards you can see only in 2021 we had more than uh i, I think my uh i can see but uh, if i move my i don't know how to move this one uh up or more than more than one billion uh, dollar uh, uh, cost for this this fire with the uh, western white wildfire of California flooding or draw western draw or the extreme uh, for the severe weather on the center Central America or the uh, different different uh, tropical storm Fred tropical storm Elsa in July seven to nine so they. Totally in 2021, they cost US to more than $1 billion of the cost. So they are pretty expensive. Um, in terms of the relationship between the uh, dis disaster uh, reduction uh, and the preparedness, which is the actually the, the which is a 
uh, indicator of the resiliency. Imagine on the social in indicator and the time, uh, imagine the uh, disaster strike happen and we're gonna have a direct loss and then we're gonna have a downtime and then we got, we're gonna have a reconstruction time uh, to get back to the point that we were uh, before the disaster. So this gonna be the recovery time and this direct loss uh, in the recovery time, times by recovery time would be a great uh, indicator for the resiliency as much as low uh, disaster uh, direct loss. And if the recovery time is low, they're gonna uh, increase our uh, resiliency actually. So let's uh, take a look to, uh, to three uh, case studies. One is the 2011 Christchurch New, uh, New, New Zealand. Uh, it just imagine this is the downtown area of the New Zealand. Um, and uh, what was the uh, catastrophe after the Christchurch? Look at the downtown and so many uh, collapse building and even even a lot of the repair, uh, the, 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 the damage building, they, they ended, ended up to just uh, reconstruct them and uh, they didn't do uh, retrofit on a lot of them. So that was the New Zealand, which was in 2011. This is one of the tall buildings in New Zealand, which got tilted and uh, they ended up to just unfortunately to like destroy it and reconstruct it. Here it is, liquefaction was one of the, on the right side, one of the big issues in the you know, share show, you can see, uh, on that, on the right side and on the left side is the damage to the columns. This is the downtown area, as you can see, most of the downtown, which is the red zone, uh, which was totally collapsed area. And the building was not usable, like the US tagging. So Nepal was was another one. There are, there there been there have been so many uh, masonry, unreinforced masonry in Nepal that that was the source of the vulner vulnerability in Nepal. So a lot of the damage, um, even even building, but didn't damage a lot. But the infills, uh, the the masonry infills, they they got damaged. So uh, you can see in the picture, and here it is the masonry infills that got damaged. So what the last one is for 2021, the uh, South Florida condom condominium tower that got partially collapsed. Uh, but the, according to the uh, lawsuit, it was the construction, uh, the vibration caused, caused by the construction on the adjacent side. Uh, but you can see a video, you can play. That shows the minute that the collapse happens partially on that one. And still look at the area that we get the right side and after that, that gonna collapse. So this was um, also caused by the, uh, like a lot of the construction issues and damages in the, the uh, situ in the in the building so uh, existing in the building uh, and and also you can see in the next uh, slides i think we are good with this one it's just repeating so as you can see here uh, there are a lot of exposed uh, the concrete is cracked Right, and a lot of exp exposed rebars and uh, rusted rebars you can see if my laptop doesn't out. So this is another one. This is the, it, it was a video by, by the buyer that uh, before, the, before that uh, event happened. So uh, still in his video, we can see the damage to the slab, a lot of damage and the rusted rebars and uh, like bad condition of the concrete. So this event, uh, this 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 uh, disaster, catastrophe. This this one caused ninety eight people. I mean, uh, ca casualty. And 
a lot of people lost their properties. And that is the 17. This was June 2021, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, right there. Okay. Right. Then, uh, water inversion, loss of the strength in the concrete. This is this is one of the items that we could see that the, it it caused the concrete uh, cracking and the rusting of the rebar. That's the main consequences. And this is what happened on the animation to the uh, condominium. It started from the basement, the middle part first, as we saw in the video collapse, uh, and then the right side, the beach side collapse. So if we look at here, this started from the basement and it was like a, a, a progressive collapse that happened first on the column side, and then the rest of the building collapse, like something like this animation. If we can see some floor, then the columns and everything collapse down like this. So um, here, how to reduce direct loss and downtime economically. So this this two uh, that actually buildings this is in Sacramento and Miyamoto International uh, we uh, retrofitted this one uh, using the viscose dampers actually uh, so the, this is a, a description briefly about the about the model the the, the, mo the modeling was in tabs and uh, I'll pass it quickly maybe not much interest about the details, but, but here is the if some information about it. And then if, if the building has, has a big issue of the soft story at, at, the, at the base, so uh, response spectrum analysis has been done and the bottom of bottom story had a maximum drift that you can see here at that time. So, uh, here is the look of the building after uh, connect uh, using the viscose dampers and the braces there, you can see. Uh, it looks really good. Maybe not a lot of the architects like it, but I mean, it works. Uh, we, can, we can show you the animation of the modeling we had. So if you focus of uh, specifically on the first level, that was the, uh, the that was the problem of the building, the soft story. We with eight dampers, we could like reduce it significantly. Um, so, um, so, so, so the, the black one is the existing, the blue one is after after retrofit. Uh, the 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 the. Uh, Drift ratio, so um, and the 1.5 percent was the limit for the shear failure. And here you see the uh, on the retrofitted one, the damper and existing. You see the comparison. So the damper one, the first floor specifically, the it got the 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 uh, uh, soft story issue got resolved. And after that, the PML analysis has been done and 90 percentile repair cost uh, decreased uh, to 12 percent. It was way higher than this. Uh, and this is the uh, this is this is done with SP3 software, by the way, the PML analysis. So here is one of the uh, uh, view from the inside after it is done. This, uh, it looks so cool. Even the cafeteria decided to uh, ramp down the table just to show to keep the damper. So the uh, saving, the earthquake insurance saving per year for the building by this retrofit became to $144,000. So the seismic cost of the building was about 800,000. 
and the, uh, which is like a we use a damper, so it's hundred thousand per damper. So which is five dollar per square feet overall. And in six years, six times this number, we can have this money back. So you, you can have your safe building resilient and have your uh, money back in six years. And uh, the construction cost, if we uh, do the code, if we do the en enhanced or some partial uh, retrofit, if we use damper and if we use isolator. So forget these numbers. I, I the, the couldn't verify these numbers, but but of course, if you if you design a building with code, and then if you retrofit a, a code, they're gonna be more expensive. Uh, the building gonna be more expensive. If we're gonna use damper, they're gonna be like like ten percent or something more uh, expensive. And if we use isolate the base isolators, they're gonna be more expensive because of the construction cost. But it is uh, way better for the, uh, the the performance of the building. So the World Bank groups, the uh, IFC, International Finance Corporation, something, they have an action plan on climate change, uh, which uh, they are considered the additional uh, construction cost uh, to see, to, to make the uh, communities uh, resilient. They, they did this program in a few developing countries like Turkey, and I think if I'm not wrong, with uh, Heidi in Indonesia or and, and, and two more. So uh, they they have that they are ident identifying risk. They have managing risk and disclose risk. Yeah, they are doing this in three uh, steps. So and uh, various disaster impact in the physical integrity and operational continuity of the building considered. Wind, uh, water, geoseismic, and fire are four different uh, like uh, hazards which considered uh, in, in, in the report. So they are, they are having different rating. Uh, A plus is the equal to A with operational continuity measure. A is the building incorporated global best practices on to, to, the, to the R, which is the worst one. The building failed to meet the requirement of any of the any any levels. So they have different uh, like 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 whatever uh, what we have it in the US. So and and there is a weakest link principle. So uh, if, for example, if uh, the, for the wind, the building is fine, for the water is totally okay, for the like uh, earthquake or geohazard is fine, but if the, for the fire is uh, vulnerable, so R rating governs and the total rating of the uh, building gonna be R. So same uh, here in, in, in one case, everything is A. So if the project meets at least three operational continuity, so it's a, a plus, otherwise uh, it's gonna be A. So there is like a business case for implementing mitigation measures. So uh, for the overall benefit cost ratio, uh, if you adopt, just, just adopt the code, or if you go above the code or building retrofit happens or lifeline, Retrofit, ret retrofit ha happens, or the, the or some or the, the highest level is the federal grants. For these three, for these five different, and for these five different hazard, they, you can you can see different uh, ratios for the uh, benefit cost ratio, or the cost and the benefit of that. So that's it. Uh, that was the uh, my my presentation and. Most of it was done with uh, Amir Gilani and uh, Keith Miyamoto. So, uh, and the ownership of the slides is for Miyamoto International. Thank you so much for this one. So I go to the question and answers. So uh, I see uh, two questions here um, for Steve and for Alex. So if you can join me, Steve and Alex, uh, we would be able 
let me stop sharing and um, if I can stop sharing, yes, then I can have you, all three of us, then we go ahead for Steve in the value planning process. Do you encounter some values that seem to be uh, contradictory? How do you handle that? Yeah, there's two examples came to mind, and thank you for the question, Heidi. And thanks for hanging in there for a long day. Um, one was uh, uh, when we have the tribes, particularly in Washington State, they have treaty rights, which are which have been affirmed and are very very strong. So they have treaty rights to to salmon, and which means they also have uh, if there's no salmon habitat, then they are losing their treaty rights. So tribes are very influential with treaty rights, but those conflict pretty much with property rights. If you're a property owner and you have a river going through your property, you know, you feel like you own the land and somehow the tribe wants you to provide habitat for them because it's their fish, not your fish. Um, so in that case, I actually just put both of them together. And I said, the uh, shared value here is uh, respect and protection of treaty rights and property rights. So they both, they everyone acknowledged that those were both important, but I think by putting them together, they also said, yeah, well, that's why we're always suing each other because we have different interpretations of what those rights are. But if we protect them in both, in whatever we do, if we protect them in both cases, then we can actually do things together. So that was one way to deal with that conflict. Uh, another one was um, uh, the city's, uh, one of the, uh, well, many, I won't, won't blame it on the cities, but there are definitely people who want to uh, dig up gravel out of the river. As I mentioned, this river has the most sediment of any river in Washington state. Um, and so, uh, and actually during the floods, the base level of the river went up and down 20 feet because of the gravel loads moving up and down. So, but the idea is that we'll just go into the back hose and we'll pull out all the gravel and then the river will stay in its bounds. Um, you know, I kind of underestimates the amount of water by a gazillion percent. So, but there's lots of people that really want that very simple answer. And people that are protecting fish habitat, including the state and tribes, are saying, well, you're ruining habitat by digging it up and, uh, and you're not going to get any flood benefits. So in that case, uh, one was protect uh, salmon habitat. The other uh, one was, you know, let's do projects as soon as possible and get rid of gravel. Both of those advocates that had written that sat at the same table and they came up with a strategy that increased salmon habitat and included removing some gravel because it benefited the habitat. So in the absence of sitting together, they're both dead, as, dead set against what they're doing. But if they're working together and looking for solutions, then they really could increase the habitat benefit and remove some gravel, which provides some benefit for, for flooding. So it was a it was a nice example of where those conflicts, uh, they don't get resolved, but you work around them and with them. Perfect. Thank you so much. So Alex, uh, next question is yours. Want to go ahead? Great. Uh, yes, it's a question about gravel and look of action. Um, so Anta, we did not or were ignoring gravel, essentially, is the short answer. Um, so the type of data we're using, CPT, can't go through gravel. So we, in effect, have a bias sample where we can only consider sands and clays. Uh, but lip fraction can occur in gravel. And people at the uh, UC Davis is probably the world lead on this in kind of developing methods to uh, consider that. Uh, so in our study, we're neglecting gravels, but uh, it can be done. Um, and hopefully people like Jason D. Young at UC Davis are thinking about it. Perfect. Any other questions from the um, people on the live? Anyone from the panel, from the speakers? So... Uh, so if no more question, I gonna I share this screen again, uh, and uh, I gonna repeat that PDH gonna be available uh, next week upon the request. 
the recording of the entire colloquium will be available and, and yesterday's symposium as well. But the colloquium will be available in a week or two, same as symposium. So for further instruction, please stay tuned. Uh, I'm gonna uh, thank again our uh, great presenters uh, uh, to, in this session and uh, today, every everyone. I want to thank uh, Jorge Mendes, our chair of the uh, San Diego chapter, uh, for doing this, and uh, the ERI, the National ERI, uh, Elizabeth and. Uh, her team, everyone was wonderful and helping us. Our sponsors, uh, FEMA, Day and Cold Tensor, uh, California Ge Ge Geological Survey, Natural Hazard Risk and Resiliency Research Center, RMA companies, Kellenfelder and Keller. Um, thanks a lot for the support and sponsoring us. So uh, anyone else, please um, yeah, wanna uh, help me uh, otherwise, if we don't have anything else, so we can call it a night. So, Jorge, do, do you have anything to add or is just leaving? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, the only, again, um, our thanks on behalf of the ERI and the ERI student chapter at the University of California, San Diego, um, our thanks to all the speakers, all attendees. Thank you, thank you very much for participating and contributing to this uh, colloquium. So hope to see you all next year for the fifth Kenji Shihara Colloquium Series on Geotechnic on Earthquake Engineering. And if you have any suggestions about topics, the theme for next colloquium, please feel free to let us know. Okay. So next year, 2023, for the fifth Kenji Shihara Colloquium Series on Earthquake Engineering. And thank you very much. Um, stay tuned. Thank you so much. Goodbye.